Well, I'll pick it up from here. Can everybody hear me? It's like we got a little, little interference going on. Are we good to go? Give me a thumbs up, somebody. We hear you. We hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, we're so glad you could join us for this segment of the Council of Churches 2021 Legislative Seminar. In case you missed the note in the chat, you've been listening to a hymn called God of the Movements and Martyrs, written by our own David Lamont, to help celebrate the 85th anniversary of the Council of last year. I'm Steve Ford. I've been a volunteer on the council staff since I retired eight years ago from the News and Observer. We encourage folks to let us know you're here and what organizations you might represent by using the chat and feel free to comment there or ask questions. Our focus for the next hour will be voting rights and the ongoing struggle in North Carolina to ensure those rights for every eligible citizen. Of course, we know that the United States has come a long ways since only white male property owners were allowed to vote. And we know that suppression of the vote, especially the votes of African-Americans, has been a favorite tactic among power-hungry politicians here and elsewhere. But the election last fall, successfully held amid a deadly pandemic, showed how determined many Americans are to vote despite obstacles of all sorts. And it showed the dedication of our election officials in making that unprecedented turnout possible, which in turn has brought a backlash from those who find all that voting to be, well, inconvenient. The council put voting rights on today's agenda in recognition that these rights are what my favorite US Senator these days, the Reverend Raphael Warnock of Georgia calls foundational. What he's getting at is that people's right to vote freely and fairly keeps other rights from being stripped away. Our workshop leader will survey the voting rights landscape as it continues to unfold in North Carolina and why these rights are so closely tied to our vision of social justice and the faith principles which that vision reflects. So that brings me to introduce our presenter, the Reverend Dr. J. Augustine. Jay's work as an attorney has drawn him into several aspects of civil rights advocacy, voting rights included, and that's the field he's now focused on with the Southern Coalition for Social Justice, which of course is based in Durham. At the same time, he has a pastor's understanding of why elections must give every citizen a fair chance to be heard at the ballot box. His current church in Durham, St. Joseph AME, is a, is a historic congregation at the crossroads of many civil rights struggles. Jay is originally from New Orleans. His law degree is from Tulane and his doctorate in ministry is from Duke. As an undergraduate, he attended Howard University on an Army ROTC scholarship, which led to service as an infantry officer before he went to law school. I should mention that Jay kindly agreed late in the going to substitute our program for Allison Riggs, co-executive director of the Southern Coalition for Social Justice, when an important voting rights trial that Allison is involved with ran into the middle of this week and took her out of the picture. But the good news is that we get to hear Jay's take on these vital issues. I'll now turn the session over to Reverend Augustine and we'll hope to have time for some Q&A before our little closing ceremony. Jay, please take it away. All right, Steve, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I wanna sincerely thank you for your hospitality. Thank you for the kind invitation. Uh, thank you also to uh, my friend and my former professor, uh, the executive director of the North Carolina Council of Churches, Dr. Jennifer Copeland. Now notice I have given her credit as my former professor. Here I am as the student. If I mess this presentation up, you know not to blame me, right? So, okay, <laughs> at any rate, um, uh, what I'd like to do today is, um, is frame the importance of where we are, uh, frame the importance of what we're looking at, what we're dealing with as a country right now, 
uh, and then talk a little bit about where we're going. And I'd like to do it in sort of an interdisciplinary fashion as going back and forth between uh, the disciplines of law and religion, two places where uh, I live, so to speak, proverbially live on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I also want to say thank you to Rachel, uh, our communications director, who is playing the TV role of Vanna today, and that she is going to be kind enough to facilitate the slides. So, Rachel, if we are ready with the presentation. All right, we are getting her teed up, and I thank you so much. Here we are with the dramatic effects, too. So I want to talk with you today about staying woke and staying engaged. This is a 2021 legislative update for the North Carolina Council of Churches. When I use the term staying woke, um, I, am, I am not using it in any pejorative sense. I'm using it really in the context of remaining socially aware, something that you all at this body has proven to be, uh, uh, I would imagine since its inception, but certainly uh, over the last years that I have surveyed it. So I appreciate your wokeness, your social awareness, and, uh, and I wanna encourage you to continue that as we talk about uh, legislation today. Next slide, please. I mentioned I wanna go back and forth a little bit between the domains of law and religion. Um, uh, Dr. King's first book, Stride Toward Freedom, is something that was very pivotal in my reading for sure. Um, but when you think about it, there is a long-standing division with some who say that the church, which is, which is not a building, it's not, it's not a, a, a brick and mortar structure, but the church is an assembly, it's a body of people, uh, that the church should not be involved in politics. Politics, going back to the etymology of the word, is nothing more than affairs of the cities or affairs of the state. Uh, if Paul writes in Romans that we should respect uh, 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 the, the, those, who are, those who are given authority, those who are in positions of governmental authority, uh, we certainly should be engaged in making sure that those people in governmental authority respect us. So some in the church, uh, as Dr. King may have said, are so heavenly holy that they can be no earthly good. That is clearly not the case with this woke group, but I think you recognize the longstanding divisions uh, that have existed uh, where many people have not uh, been engaged in the body politics. They've relegated themselves to salvation in the kingdom to come, uh, rather than being engaged with social justice matters here in the kingdom at hand. I believe the two go hand in hand, and I think that is symbolized by the cross. So the progressive church showed her wokeness with the two planes of the cross. And what do I mean by that? In that book, Stride Toward Freedom, I wanna read for you a very brief quote from Dr. King, which has certainly been pivotal in my ministry, but something I would ask you to keep in mind today as we go through the slides and thinking literally about the two planes, the vertical and the horizontal of the Christian cross. And here is Dr. King. But a religion true to its nature must also be concerned about man's social conditions. Religion deals with both earth and heaven and both time and eternity. Religion operates not only on the vertical plane, but also on the horizontal. It seeks not only to integrate men with God, but to integrate men with men and each man with himself. Ladies, forgive Martin, he was a product of his time. This is men in a generic sense for people here, of course. Any religion that professes to be concerned with the souls of men and is not concerned with the slums that damn them, the economic conditions that strangle them and the social conditions that cripple them is a dry as dust religion. Again, we should never be so heavenly holy that we can be no earthly good. Next slide, please. I want you to take a moment and think about that visual on the left. January 6th for me was a real day of demarcation and a day of return. When I say a day of return, there is the old expression, of course, which goes, uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. As I think about where we are now as a country, as I think about the causes uh, that we're having to take up the, that necessitate uh, the church's engagement in action, and when I think about where the country was uh, years and years ago, uh, 
we regretfully have regressed rather than progressed. Here is what I mean by that. In the, in the period after Reconstruction, as to where Reconstruction was a very, very progressive period, in the period after Reconstruction, starting uh, with the compromise of the 1876 election and certainly with the 1877 troop withdrawal uh, from the South, you started to see vigilantism and you started to see law enforcement uh, make a deliberate effort to put certain demographic groups, including African Americans, or particularly African Americans, in their place, in their quote unquote place. Uh, we saw the rise of Jim Crow laws. Uh, we saw the uh, usurpation. Uh, uh, we saw the we saw the deliberate attempts to take away uh, the right to vote. We saw disenfranchisement uh, as we did in a pre-Reconstruction era. Uh, my my my. We saw violence and vigilantism where African-Americans were widely lynched, where there were shootings from both uniformed officers or by uniformed officers, as well as, as, well as vigilante hate groups like the Klan. Um, and the church was called to be engaged, not just in matters with the kingdom to come, but to also address matters in the kingdom at hand. As far as I'm concerned, January 6th was a day of reckoning uh, where well, we looked backward much more so than looking forward. As I think about the role of the church, again, which is an assembly, which is a group of people, as I think about what the Lord said, Jesus was quoted from reading from the scrolls of the prophet Isaiah in Luke 4, uh, 18 and 19, where he says, he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free. My goodness gracious, that's a sermon entirety of itself, right? But the church should be engaged, not just in matters of seeking salvation in the kingdom to come, but the church should be addressed in matters for social justice here in the kingdom at hand. I'm only underscoring the importance of what we are all doing. Next slide, please. The Bible supports wokeness. The Bible supports being involved, and I appreciate the way you are involved. Carl Bart made the comment that we must hold the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. That is the preaching ministry I have been called to. And as we move into talking about legislation, uh, the New International Version tells us from that prophet Isaiah, woe to those who make unjust laws, to those who issue oppressive decrees, deprive the poor of their rights and withhold justice. Um, yesterday, I was honored to stand with Dr. Copeland um, at Mount Lebanon AME Zion Church over in Elizabeth City uh, as we were trying to hold accountable those who are trying to withhold justice. Um, as we're dealing with the vigilantism and as we're dealing with police officers who are returning us to the proverbial wild, wild west, uh, the same sort of landscape that existed in that post reconstruction period. I made reference to. So I think it's important that the church is involved and that the church is aware that the church is woke. Uh, so thank you for being who you are, North Carolina Council of Churches. Next slide, please. What I'd like to do here is have a very high level overview of uh, a few bills in particular that are now pending before the North Carolina General Assembly. Um, in particular, Senate Bill 326, House Bill 446, House Bill 542, uh, combined with Senate Bill 716. And I'd like to ask the question to again return to Dr. King, where do we go from here? The title of his uh, fourth and final book. Uh, and then, of course, we want to open for questions and answers. And I'm going to do my best to keep us, as a matter of fact, I will promise to keep us on time. Um, I want you to think about, again, if I would, in attempting to draw a parallel, think about where we were post-Reconstruction, where there were deliberate legislative attempts. Isaiah said, woe to those who legislate evil. There were deliberate legislative attempts to curtail power, uh, to, to, to keep and marginalize African-Americans. Think about what you have seen in a very popular context now, uh, the legislation from Georgia, very draconian, I think Senate Bill 2, if I'm not mistaken, but very draconian legislation uh, passed by the by the Georgia legislature, signed into law by their governor, uh, uh, purging voters from the rolls, uh, closing polling places, 
um, a, a very draconian attempt to carve out, as the Fourth Circuit said in, uh, in the McCrory decision a few years ago, uh, with surgical precision, targeted at African Americans with surgical precision, uh, we again have seen a return. This is, this is the Make America Great Again narrative that continues post-presidency of whoever was the 45th president, right? But this narrative continues, this mindset continues, and that's why it's important to stay woke. Next slide, please. A little bit by way of high level overview on Senate Bill 326. This is dubbed the Election Integrity Act. Remember the narrative that led up to that insurrection, the picture I showed you uh, from January the 6th. The narrative was that they've stolen the election. We don't want those people voting. Who are those people? The voters in Detroit? The voters in Atlanta? Those people, right? So the Election Integrity Act would require uh, that mail-in ballots be received by election day instead of three days after. Note this, uh, under current North Carolina law, voters can request an absentee ballot until one week before the election. Senate Bill 326 would move this to two weeks. So you'd have to request your absentee ballot for two weeks, uh, uh, up to two weeks prior to the election. Well, what does the data say? The data says that in 2020 and in 2016, there were 35,000 people most recently and 26,000 people four years ago who requested absentee ballots during the time at issue. If you drill down a little bit more and you think demographically about where those individuals probably are from in terms of socioeconomic class, in terms of ethnic class, this is a bill that is targeted to suppress minority voters. Uh, Senate Bill 326 would shorten the window when absentee ballots can be accepted. Uh, under current law, absentee ballots that are postmarked on election day and received up to three days later are valid. So let's think for a moment to unpack that. Think for a moment about normal circumstances within a city, within a within a where you'd be uh, uh, dropping a ballot in the mail to uh, to the election office. Uh, within a city, normally two days, something certainly is received. Um, if you're voting on election day and you choose to do so by mail, how is that any different than going down to the polling place? Uh, uh, so, so in this case, uh, the intent here obviously is to curb those who will participate in the political process by requiring that all absentee ballots be received by 5 p.m. on election day if they are to count. When you look back at the data, 2020 and 2018, the two most recent elections in North Carolina showed that there were 12,000 and 11,000 people respectively uh, whose votes were counted that were received within three days of election day uh, in, both those, uh, in both those instances. Those votes in this case, if this bill passes, uh, would disenfranchise, again, 12,000 people in 2020 and 11,000 people uh, in 2018. Next slide, please. All right, a little bit about House Bill 446. Uh, this is captioned Safeguarding Voting Rights. Uh, it codifies uh, various, uh, excuse me, that should be voter friendly. I apologize for the typo, several voter friendly changes in election rules. This is a law that would seek to expand voter registration. It would mandate that all eligible voters who apply for a driver's license or North Carolina ID will automatically be registered unless they decline. Can I share with you, as I may say on Sunday, can I get a witness, right? I wanna share with you um, uh, uh, or in the court of law, here's my testimony. Um, I, am, I am still a, a relatively recent uh, 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 convert, if you will, to North Carolina, to the culture here. I love Bull City and I love North Carolina. Um, but as someone who came from Louisiana, I had to make a deliberate attempt two stops to get a driver's license in one place and to register to vote in another place. This bill obviously would make it convenient, uh, especially when you think about the demographic of poor people or, or, or people who are working class people, people who um, have wage jobs opposed to salary jobs. Uh, this bill takes away the convenience of one-stop shopping, so to speak, right? Um, this bill also would eliminate um, uh, I'm sorry, this bill also would make it convenient there. This bill would have an automatic restoration of voting rights after completion of a felony sentence. Uh, you will recall in Florida very recently, the last two years, that has been a very, very hot political issue 
uh, with their governor not wanting to restore voting rights to those who have completed their sentences and those who have paid all associated fines and the like. This bill uh, uh, would make that automatic in North Carolina. House Bill 446 would also expand online voter registration and improve voting by mail. Uh, the county would pay for postage on absentee ballots and provide a secure ballot drop box or provide secure ballot drop boxes, plural. Uh, uh, it would designate election day as a paid state holiday. It would also, um, uh, under the current rules, um, uh, it's in the House committee, rather a procedural mechanism. It's in the House Rules Committee, where oftentimes good legislation goes to die. And I need not tell you who is in charge at the General Assembly. Next slide, please. All right, a little bit on House Bill 426. This bill would amend the North Carolina Constitution to create an independent redistricting process, including a citizens redistricting commission. This is huge. On the November 22 ballot, November 2022 ballot, voters uh, would decide on a constitutional amendment for an independent process for general assembly and congressional seats. If voted for, a citizens redistricting commission, which would be comprised of 15 members with 10 year terms, would redraw district lines instead of lawmakers. Let's just pause for a moment. Why is that so incredibly important? As, as, as much as I, I hate to point out the obvious, I want to point out the obvious that the currently constituted General Assembly uh, is, a, is an illegally constituted body. Uh, when, when, when they took uh, a majority status, uh, they, they gerrymandered districts using racialized data, and the Supreme Court said that it was an illegal racial gerrymander, but they gave themselves a supermajority, and, uh, and that supermajority was, was illegally constituted. As my mother used to say, this is not just wrong, this is as wrong as two left feet, right? So, so they are an illegally constituted body, but there was never a day of reckoning. There was never a, a, a requirement that they redistrict or re, re, uh, uh, redraw the lines that were illegally drawn. So this body continues to stand. It continues to pass legislation and it's very protective of itself. So this commission, this public commission, would not have partisanship in mind. It would not have uh, 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 incumbency in mind. This is an independent citizens commission that would redraw based on population and presumably other non-political factors, again, opposed to racialized data, opposed to partisan data, et cetera, which makes gerrymandering illegal. All meetings of this commission uh, would be open to the public with no less than 14 days notice there would be a minimum of 20, excuse the typo again, it would be a minimum of 20 meetings to allow for maximum citizen input and comment. The commission would also be required to explain changes to district lines if questioned, unlike now, for example, reapportionment or redistricting rather is done via legislation and who gets a chance to question the way the sausage is made. So this is a high level summary of House Bill 426. Next slide, please. All right, a little bit about the combined uh, measures here. House Bill uh, 524, as well as Senate Bill 716. They are termed Fix Our Democracy Act. House Bill 524, as well as Senate Bill 716, would make several reforms in election and campaign laws. Among them, they would implement online voter registration for everyone, not just people who go down to the DMV, but online voter registration for everyone, or the ability to do so at least. Uh, 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 they would create automatic voter registration at government agencies, and they would limit voter purges. Voter purges to me are uh, just really unconscionable uh, uh, to, to share with you my honest opinion. I don't think it's right to, to take away something from someone because they have not used it in, in, in a particular time. I guess the best way I can, I can analogize that, to analogize that, to put it in real context, probably the most popular, unpopular, if you will, voter purges occurred uh, in the Georgia gubernatorial election 
where so many thousands, hundreds of thousands were, were purged from the rolls, uh, 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 primarily in African-American communities, and the margin of victory uh, for the now incumbent was less than the amount purged. And, uh, and those are individuals who diligently attempted to vote for uh, uh, the, the, the candidate who did not run. I don't wanna say a name. I think we all know who we're talking about here, but, but, but to purge someone for the voter rolls from the voter rolls to me is unconscionable. I liken that to, um, and this is a good thing, right? I have, I have a couple of dollars, couple as in at least two, maybe one, two, but a couple of dollars in an account uh, that I have not touched in a few years, right? I'd like to think that's a good thing. And hopefully there's been at least two cents interest over those years. So maybe I've got $2 and two cents now. But, uh, but the last thing I want is for someone to take from me something that I have because I haven't used it. So if I get notice from the bank that, uh, that now, uh, uh, Mr. Augustine, we've now taken your $2, you now are, are, are zero balance or you're in the negative because you haven't used it. Hey, hey, wait a minute. To me, that is what voter purging is like. It's like taking away something just because you haven't used it in a particular period of time. Again, as you talk about targeting voters, who is, who is more likely to not use it? Those individuals who've got to get to work, those individuals who have wage jobs opposed to salary jobs. So, Again, this is an attempt at voter suppression, uh, which uh, which I think is is unconscionable. Um, the 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 term, uh, excuse me, the Fix Our Democracy Act would also uh, create on college campuses polling places uh, on all college campuses with an enrollment of 4,500 students or more, making things accessible and easy for people to participate. It would return the absentee ballot. Uh, verifying signature requirement to one witness instead of two. And the laws uh, would also promote fair redistricting with no role from the legislature. All right, next slide, please. The question I want to ask of you is this, where do we go from here? Where do we go in terms of your wokeness in being engaged in the affairs of the city uh, or the affairs of the state? Uh, where do we go in terms of the vigilante justice that we're seeing, the, re the, the, the resurrection, if you will, I hate to use that term with church folks, the, uh, the rebirth, if you will, of the vigilante justice that we're seeing uh, in terms of the, um, uh, uh, the lack of, of consideration, the lack of, of protecting and serving from law enforcement to uh, getting out of a vehicle and start guns a-blazing. Uh, uh, where do we go from here? Because we're returning to a space where we were uh, in the 1870s, post-Reconstruction. We really, really have regressed uh, rather than progress. Um, so the question is, what roles, plural, are you willing to play in working for justice and thinking about the biblical narrative and thinking about the ministry, since I'm talking to a Christian group, and thinking about the ministry of Jesus the Christ? He not only... Uh, 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 died and was resurrected for salvation in the kingdom to come, but he lived a life that was an exemplar of social justice in the kingdom at hand. Um, how will you continue to be engaged during this critical time in American history with all of the things that are going on before us? How will the church respond? Jesus certainly responded to the unfair dictates of the Roman Empire that were going on in his day. Um, and obviously, uh, a whole bunch of other folks that formed an organization to which we now belong called the church responded to. Will you remain woke or will you do a Rip Van Winkle? I hope nobody goes to sleep. Please remain woke, remain engaged. Uh, 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 uh. Please continue to promote justice and fairness for all. Next slide, please. Now, I promised I was going to get you on time. Steve, I have attempted uh, to be a person of my word. Again, if there were any errors or omissions in the presentation, let's blame that on, on, on Dr. Jennifer, the professor, instead of the student who's here presenting my attempt at levity. But anyway, um, I want to open up now for questions and answers. And, uh, and if you have any questions, I hope I have an answer. Uh, but this is really a time for a dialogue for us to talk about next steps and how can you remain involved, hopefully. So um, I am completely open. Let me, let me take the opportunity to, uh, to, to raise a, a specific issue that, of course, is, is uh, on everybody's mind these days, and particularly uh, 
Ms. Allison Riggs, uh, who heads of the Southern Coalition for Social Justice, and that is uh, voter ID and the trial that she is uh, that she is uh, playing a, a leading part in. Um, you know, th th this is an issue that, in some respects, you can argue it up up one side and down the other. You can uh, you can you can uh, slice and dice all the numbers in terms of uh, who doesn't have an ID, who how this matches with people who vote or don't vote. But, um, you know, you, you also, when you boil it down, it seems to me, and I'd like to get your thoughts on this, you know, you, you, end up, you end up with a fundamental question. Why do we need this? Why do we need it? And, um, you know, a, as I think has been fairly well shown, in, the instances of the type of fraud that a voter ID system would, would prevent are, are, are just about vanishingly small. So, you know, what, what, what's the most effective way to push back against uh, these uh, voter ID requirements, which in fact are now in the state constitution and which if this law that is being challenged goes into effect, you know, would uh, take effect. And, and, it, and it could even, uh, it could even uh, spill over into people who are voting absentee, which would have a, uh, which would be a real disincentive in a, in a, in a voter suppression tactic. So, if, so you could you, please, you turn, if you could if you could frame your thoughts around that issue, we'd appreciate it. Sure. Thank you so much for the question, too. I, I think you have you have uh, uh, used the, the the very appropriate language and that this is a voter suppression tactic. Uh, we didn't just come about here. This is not something that was just pie in the sky. Uh, this is the, 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 the statute that is being challenged now. Senate Bill 682. For, forgive me for forgetting the number. Uh, but the statute that Allison is leading the charge on right now in court, in Superior Court in Wake County, uh, it, the, the case is uh, uh, Holmes v. Moore, Jabari Holmes uh, v. Tom Moore. Um, um, this is a matter that is a successor to House Bill 589. And I remember House Bill 589 so well because that case was tried and appealed and it was the United States Fourth Circuit Court of Appeal uh, that called the state of North Carolina to the carpet, a call specifically the General Assembly to the carpet with using a quote after looking at all of the demographic data, after looking at the specific request for racialized data, for looking at demographic data uh, that went into this supermajority, this illegally constituted supermajority's consideration when they enacted the law, uh, when they had self-preservation intent to, 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 as the old saying goes, uh, the representatives, excuse me, the voters were not choosing the representatives, but the representatives were attempting to choose the voters. Um, uh, so House Bill 589, as the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals said, looking at everything across the board, the General Assembly, and I quote, targeted African-Americans with almost surgical precision. Wow. This bill is a successor to that. <laughs> so the courts have said that House Bill 589 is unconstitutional. This will not be enforced. Um, uh, this legislation now is round two by the same actors who have the same political interests, who are doing the same thing and who are trying to tire folks out. So thank goodness uh, for Allison's heroism. Thank goodness for organizations like the Southern Coalition for Social Justice to challenge laws like that. Now, on its face, when you talk about targeting someone or targeting a particular demographic with surgical precision, uh, we, are, we are not talking about um, uh, just across the board, hey, come and any ID you have is okay. We're talking about when you look and you say what type of IDs are okay. Just to give this as an example, um, I'm, a, I'm a proud veteran. I served four years on active duty as a proud infantry lieutenant in the United States Army. Again, I said, as I talked about the imagery from the Capitol, I love America. I still have a, a, a photo ID which shows I, I served as a military officer, indefinite, will never expire, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that photo ID is okay if I want to go vote. It would have been okay under legislation. However, uh, uh, if I had a government assistance ID, if I, if I was receiving governmental assistance for food, for housing or something, and that, that I had that sort of ID, that would not have been okay. My, 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 who are you targeting? Every time we listen to the news, we hear and we talk about, well, the overseas ballots are gonna come in. Those overseas ballots usually lean to one candidate or usually lean to one political party because those are usually the military ballots. Okay, so that means the inner city ballots, 
right? The folks who may have the other types of ID, they may lean to the other political party. So we're going to excise them. We're going to cut them right out of the political process. This is what I mean. That's just one example, a high level example of targeting again with surgical precision. Um, so, so that's the sort of uh, 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 protectionism that this General Assembly has engaged in and that they have engaged in again. And that is what Allison is challenging now in a high level uh, uh, explanation that is challenged now in court. I should also note that um, uh, Allison and the Southern Coalition for Social Justice have been successful in a preliminary fashion, not here in trial on the marriage. We don't know what's gonna happen yet, but, but this, this matter, the reason the photo ID requirement was not already in place for the 2020 general election was because she received what's called a preliminary injunction in joining enforcement of that constitutional mandate that you referenced from some time ago uh, because of the illegal nature, the racialized nature uh, that, this, that this legislature, that this General Assembly adopted. In other words, by issuing the preliminary injunction, the standard for that is that the court has got to feel you have a strong likelihood of prevailing on the merits. She's already shown the cards and we've already seen she's got a strong likelihood. She, meaning the organization, has a strong likelihood of prevailing. So, uh, so again, this is, a, this is another racialized attempt, regretfully, by the General Assembly to engage in self-protectionism, to, to pick the voters rather than the voters picking the members of the General Assembly. Yeah. Well, thank you for that overview. I see we're starting to get some questions about redistricting, which, of course, is another topic that's uh, right uh, top of mind for a lot of folks. And, and uh, you know, in fact, as, as we've probably seen in the news, uh, the, with uh, recent census results uh, just being released, it looks like North Carolina is going to get another congressional district. And of course, you try to you, you try to draw 14 districts where there have been 13, and there's going to be a lot of redrawing of lines. And uh, I mean, just in the, in the natural course of things. But the question becomes, you know, whether those lines are going to be drawn in a reasonably fair way, giving, giving uh, you know, everybody a chance to cast a vote that counts as much as everybody else's vote. And we've seen uh, 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 redistricting plans here are challenged on the basis of racial discrimination, uh, excessive partisanship. Uh, courts have agreed with the attacks along both of those lines. Uh, what is your sense of whether we can take our legislative leaders at their word when they say that this process this year is going to be, at least it's going to be open and transparent? I'm smiling, yeah. right? And I'm smiling for a reason because, because so often the old, if I can get the cliche or the expression correct, uh, 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 judge me not so much based on what I say I'm going to do, but judge me based on what I've already done. Right. <laughs> we have we have already seen a, a confirmed pattern and practice of behavior from this legislature, which goes back for more than 10 years, at least 10 years uh, uh, when it engaged in racial gerrymandering and political gerrymandering uh, back in 2011 after coming to power uh, with the last census, the last uh, uh, data that was that was given by the census. Uh, we've had multiple occasions. Uh, where local authorities uh, have attempted to act in ways to, to circumvent minority voters from being engaged. Um, uh, based on what we've seen from this General Assembly in the past, we have absolutely no reason to believe uh, that they want to cooperate and be fair going forward or in the present. And, and my reflection for the present really is a uh, high level overview again of the bills I made reference to, not so much the progressive bills, but think about what they're attempting to do in terms of circumventing the rights of those who want to vote, who they're targeting at to vote, uh, who they're targeting at to eliminate the voting rights, um, eliminate voting rights. Um, if it's not based on race, it's based on socioeconomic status. Um, uh, those are, those are um, I, I think, um, can, I, can I tell you, I'm a Christian minister, but I listen to more than just, um, more than just gospel music. And the, and the, the talented, Poet Laureate Ice Cube has a rap which says, in some regards, uh, a certain demographic is too broke to be Republican, right? So <laughs> we'll leave it at that and say that this is a group that is very, that is engaged very much in self-protectionism, not just from the racial perspective, but also from a socioeconomic perspective, because again, they're targeting voters to eliminate. They're targeting those that they want to leave out. 
I have no reason to believe, we should have no reason to believe that they'll be forthright in going forward because they're not forthright with, with what is in the General Assembly now, and they certainly have not been forthright from bills that have been, uh, um, been brought forward in the past. Thank you. Let, 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 me, let me throw just one other sort of broad theme at you, and that's, that's one I think that, that, that many, many of us uh, church-based advocates sometimes have a hard time with, and that is, you know, what as a practical matter on the ground can, can we do? I mean, what one, one response is, well, you all can go vote. Everybody can go vote. Vote for the legislators that are, that are going to uh, pursue a, an agenda that, that, that you favor. And it is going to be is going to be fairer, and it's going to be more uh, mindful of voting rights. But you know, with with the people who are in power and setting the rules, well, they make it hard to vote. So you know, or harder, I should say. So you know that 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 uh, that solution uh, it it kind of you know it kind of slips through your fingers if if that's if that's the uh, if that's your remedy. Uh, uh, Going to vote and and, and backing uh, backing uh, candidates who favor your agenda. Uh, well, since the, the 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 folks who are setting the rules are in many cases opposed to that agenda and they set the rules, this can be a this can be a tough nut to crack. So, you know, to 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 try to get to the bottom line of this question, what 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 do you favor in terms of? You know, using the leverage in, in your congregation, your faith communities, to try to effectuate the sort of changes that we would that we would favor. There is there is so much to be done because, um, in many regards, to go back to my comments about the regress we've made and how we've gone back to a post reconstruction sort of time period. Um, uh, to use a construction analogy or a renovation analogy, uh, the house has been gutted. Right, the the things are bare, so we all are in a process of rebuilding. So voting is just one aspect of rebuilding. That's just one thing. There's so many things that need to be done. We need new flooring. We need new plumbing. We're down to the studs here. We basically are rebuilding democracy. And I want to think that I know that people of faith uh, play an incredibly important role there. And I want to think that people will be willing to, or people are willing to continue playing a role aside from just, or in addition to the convenience of voting. Um, if I were to sort of in an umbrella fashion say, uh, uh, be engaged, remain woke, I would ask you to identify your issue or issues, plural, and pursue those issues with passion. Let me give two quick examples. Um, um, the biblical canon, if you really connect the dots, going back to the Old Testament and certainly with the migrant story of Jesus, uh, moving from one place to another in fear of government persecution, uh, the biblical canon is, is, is filled with examples of migration slash immigration. Um, the morality of that, what we have done as a country in attempting to reform a system uh, has been immoral. Separating children from families at the border, the inhumane conditions in which children continue to live in cages, uh, it's completely immoral. If immigration, to use that as one discrete example, if immigration is your issue, there are a gazillion ways in which congregations can be actively involved in trying to bring about effective immigration reform. If I have done that in the congregation, I, 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 in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very real sense, I did that in a very real sense. Um, um, another thing that I have done more recent than immigration, another effort I have led as a pastor more recent than immigration reform, or immigration engagement, um, vaccine hesitancy is real. Uh, 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 as I think about going back a few months ago, and I think about the data we were seeing demographically going back a year and, and a little less than a year ago, pre-vaccine, who was being hit hardest by the, by the COVID-19 pandemic it was the African-American community, black and brown communities. Uh, 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 when, the, when the vaccines were developed, who were the last that were being vaccinated? The African-American community. Then we crossed a hurdle where there was wide availability of vaccines, but there was a natural hesitancy, of course, in the African-American community uh, because of incidents like the Tuskegee experiment from yesteryear, right? So as a pastor, as a faith leader, um, I was on camera having 
uh, first or second shot, but whenever the news cameras rolled it and I talked about this being safe, uh, I promoted it. The church, the congregation uh, hosted two vaccine clinics on site at St. Joseph. We also did a vaccine clinic in concert or in combination with North Carolina Central University, neighboring institution in Durham, uh, HBCU, uh, 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 and we hosted on site with them on their campus. Those are two institutions. The church had an active role in both, obviously, as a physical host for one, as a spiritual host, as a logistical host for the other. But in, in both of those instances, three different times, I should say, um, people had an opportunity to look and to go not to a government building, but to go to a trusted institution in their community where they could feel safe and where hesitancy was at least curtailed, subsided, if you will. So those are just two examples. I, I saw something this morning, um, you know, we've got maybe a third, if you will, of, of Americans have been vaccinated. Um, there's so many that have not, so many people are still waiting, so many people are still hesitant, so many people still have hesitancy. Be an advocate for the vaccines, get the data, but be an advocate for, for individuals becoming vaccinated to help the economy get back to normal, to help people get back to normal activities. There are so many things that churches, faith leaders can do, people who are engaged in the, in the faith communities, so many things that can be done aside from just voting. So I encourage you to find your issue or issues, plural, and please be engaged. All right. Rachel, are you picking up any uh, further questions uh, from our uh, our uh, attendees here on the chat that uh, that we should uh, that we should raise? Yeah, I see one question here that is that has been uh, uh, posed as a follow-up. And I, I, and I guess it, 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 it builds on, on the previous question, but, but uh, it asks that we drill down into specifically what can uh, members of the clergy be doing to, uh, to uh, help advance voter rights. Um, so I would, I would encourage there may be legislation out that is attempting to, um, I've seen it at least in some states, I'm trying to think about North Carolina as I'm, as I'm talking, um, to eliminate uh, what I will call bulk voter registration. I, I, I grew up in a space with, with from my mother to civic activities with my beloved fraternity uh, through the church as well of doing voter registration drives, of making sure individuals are registered to vote. You sign a card, you do everything else, you leave it here, and we'll get this turned in for you on Monday and you go down to, to an office and turn everything in. Uh, that's that's low-hanging fruit, assuming this, this legislature does not enact draconian measures that would eliminate that, right? Uh, that's low-hanging fruit. Encourage people hosting forms. Um, I, uh, I commend my first uh, uh, interaction with the, with the North Carolina Council of Churches um, uh, uh, I guess a hearing about it, of course, through my, my, my academic tenure and being exposed to, to Jennifer to Dr. Copeland as a professor. Uh, but my first practical interaction was, a, was an environmental justice space or a cre creation care space yeah. that was being hosted in Raleigh at a church in Raleigh uh, that I attended. And I was, I was so moved to see the church woke, the church engaged in the community. Voting rights is one thing. Uh, it's important, I think, to testify at the legislature. It's important, I think, to testify at your at your local uh, uh, council meetings, be it virtually or be it in person, once we get clearance to go back to that space. But faith leaders, when you're involved, uh, it makes all the difference in the world. When people of faith are involved, it makes all the difference in the world. Um, I got I got several calls today, uh, uh, and I was on a Zoom just prior to being on this one. Someone said, I saw you on page two of the Washington Post. Now let's unpack that for a moment. What does that mean? And by the way, if I was on page two of the Washington Post, I was standing right next to Dr. Copeland. I mean, she was on page two of the Washington Post also, but this was, this was faith leaders who were speaking out, uh, 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 demanding transparency in government, demanding reforms in a system, in this case, policing that is broken in a specific locale. Uh, but when faith leaders bring attention to a matter, people notice. And it, it makes a difference. So what we did yesterday was one example of how faith leaders can be engaged in demanding access to the ballot and demanding that draconian laws are not passed by the, by the General Assembly uh, and holding individuals accountable 
uh, uh, and it's, it's, it's time out for just for just talking about salvation and the kingdom to come. Mm -hmm. if you know what I read from Dr. King, yeah. anything, those two planes of the cross, we've got to also be concerned about equity, fairness, diversity, and inclusion here in the kingdom at hand. And those kinds of efforts can take place uh, all completely off to the side of a partisan political effort. Absolutely so. And, and notice that the things I've advocated here, please notice I've been very discreet anytime I've referenced R or D. My, my, my comments or the spirit of my comments have absolutely nothing to do with partisanship, yeah. but they have everything to do with politics. Again, going to the etymology of the term, we're talking about the affairs of the cities or the states, affairs of the city or affairs of the state being civically engaged. If, if there is a well-reasoned position that is on side R, go with the well-reasoned position for you on side R. If there's a well-reasoned position on side D, go with the well-reasoned position on side D. All I'm advocating, number one, I, I don't think the church should bury its head in the sand. And there's some, some uh, 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 faith groups who again do believe, you know, we only wanna talk about salvation and the kingdom to come. We don't, the church shouldn't be engaged in these matters. I don't, I don't, I don't think that's appropriate. I don't think that models the life or ministry of Jesus. So I'm encouraging us to be active and actively engaged in affairs of the cities as was Christ. I'm not advocating you take a partisan position as a group. How you choose to vote is how you choose to vote. How you choose to donate your money is how you choose to donate your money. My whole purpose is saying as a group who clearly comes to the table with morality, as a group who clearly comes to the table as followers of Christ who believe in an inclusive society, yeah. take a position to demand inclusion, take it to take a position that says we don't, we will not advocate or we will not allow exclusion, particularly as we've seen exclusion based on race and exclusion based on socioeconomic status. Well, that, that, that's the exact uh, um, um, dichotomy that I, that uh, it, it leaped to mind to me, uh, being inclusive versus exclusive. And there's a whole range of policies that, 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 that tend toward inclusiveness and also are the ones that uh, most closely attune to many of our basic faith principles. Absolutely. Let's see. Um, I think we may have, uh, we may have, uh, gotten to the bottom of questions that folks are raising. Um, I have I have sufficiently bored yeah. you is what you're trying to tell me, Steve. That's what you're trying. You're trying to say it politely. I have sufficiently <laughs> bored everyone. They are they are not figuratively going to sleep. They are literally going to sleep now and they're ready for the next. <laughs> is that what you're trying to tell me, Steve? I don't think that's the case, sir. Uh, <laughs> as a matter of fact, we uh, we deeply appreciate the uh, the uh, very thoughtful review of of, of uh, some complicated intertwined issues here that uh, uh, affect uh, many things going on in our world and uh, that our, our church communities are, uh, are, are trying to make a positive contribution to. So uh, your, your expertise has been uh, very much appreciated. Well, it's a pleasure to share with you and I really appreciate the invitation. And, uh, and I, as I was telling Dr. Copeland yesterday, I look forward to further collaboration with the council. The work you all do is phenomenal. Um, and I am, uh, I'm certainly looking forward to being further engaged. Okay. We are going to try to shift back to our little closing litany here, if I can see it on my screen, which I can't at this point. Rachel, I am not seeing the slide, unfortunately. Perhaps. Uh, if that doesn't want to come up, perhaps I, you, I, you, you could. I send it to you in the. I send it to you in the chat if you want I, to I read that. It. Yeah. Okay. We'll do it. We'll do it. We have a uh, we have a short litany here that sort of closes the circle on many of the things we've been talking about. 
and we invite you to uh, recite along and uh, I will lead it off. God of peace, you have shown yourself to us as one who demonstrated what true power looks like by refusing to use violence. We are willing to follow your way of peace. God of justice, you have invited us into peacemaking work by showing us that justice is the first ingredient. We are willing to work for your way of justice. God of righteousness, you have provided the means for all creation to flourish when we walk your righteous path. We are willing to be your righteous people. Okay, that will conclude our session today. Thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you again to Reverend Alexander for uh, giving us his time on short notice. And we encourage you to stay with the further uh, uh, sessions of the legislative seminar on tomorrow and Friday. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you again.